Hello, welcome back to my channel. And today I'm going to read a short story from a book called Haunting Stories of Ghosts and Ghouls. And the short story that I will read is called Appointment with Death. Whether the apparition that came to Thomas, Lord Littleton, in the night and gave him a grim warning was a ghost or a dream, we shall never know. Much has been written about it. Some people believe in the ghost, some did not. And when the warning came, there were explanations to prove that the whole affair could have been quite natural. Even Lord Lettleton himself, in the half-hour before his death, joyfully convinced himself that the ghostly visitor had been a mere dream. But had it? One evening, in the November of 1779, Lord Lettleton called for his servant and announced that he was going to bed. The servant raised an eyebrow. His master was not in the habit of retiring at such an early hour. Usually it was long after midnight, and sometimes, when he was entertaining guests, they would sit talking until dawn. The servant halted discreetly before leaving the room. I hope you're not ill, my lord, he said. No, no, William, Lord Lytleton answered. I'm quite well, but I think that for once I will retire at a reasonable hour. I feel restless. Perhaps it is the atmosphere. Heavy dank, as though a storm is on its way. Shortly afterward, Lord Lytleton was lying comfortably in his vast four-poster bed, having a drunk a glass of medicine to calm his nerves. William drew the curtains round the bed, quietly put on the lights, and tiptoed out of the room. The minutes went by. Outside, the heavy stillness gave way to a... to a gusty wind which rustled through the trees in the garden and caused the branches to tap at the window, preventing Lord Lytleton from dropping off to sleep. He tossed and turned, trying to make himself comfortable, but his thoughts raced after each other, and the noise of heavy rain and the periodic striking of parish church clock kept him awake. What seemed hours later, just as he was on the edge of a sleep, a different sound jerked him back into wakefulness. As though pulled by a string, he sat up in bed and peered into the darkness. The sound seemed to be the flapping wings of a huge bird, and it came from inside the room. Strange, he thought. No bird could, no bird could possibly get in, and he felt his heartbeat quicken. What could it be? Dare he climb out of the bed to investigate, or should he call William? Then the flapping stopped making the silence that followed even more frightening. It was a very silence, as though a waiting, listening presence were in the room with him. He felt a urge to cry out for help. He tried, but no sound would come. Sitting bolt upright, Lord Lightenton found himself focused on the curtain at the foot of the bed. As he gazed at it, to his horror, it began to move. Slowly it fell back in there, in an unearthly light stood his visitor. It was the most beautiful, the most angelic woman he had ever seen in his life. Whatever horrific spectre he had thought to see was far removed from this. Again he tried to speak, and again no sound came. All he could do was sit there, a slightly ridiculous figure, and stare at the tall, stately, unknown woman. Then she spoke. Thomas, Lord Lighton. Take note of my words. It was a wonderful voice, commanding and yet strangely beautiful, but it was not human. It sounded like winds and waves, yet it had an echo of the tomb. It came from all places at once, a voice he could almost feel as well as hear. This is the woman. Slowly the curtain fell back and there, in an earthly light, stood his visitor. Take note of my words and prepare yourself. In three days' time, at the hour of twelve, prepare yourself for death. In three days' time, you will die. Prepare yourself. Terror overcame Lord Lytleton. Sweat trickled down his face as he tried to force his voice to ask the question of the vision, but all the noise he made was an ugly croaking. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Gradually, the voice of the mysterious woman faded. She herself began to fade. 
the curtains dropped back into the place, and all was silent again. Exhausted with fear and anguish, Lord Lyttelton fell back in a dead faint. When William came in the morning to wake his master, he thought he had a stroke or seizure during the night, and when at last he succeeded in waking him, the noble lord was far from normal. William did not know what to do. Should he go at once for a doctor? Ought he to leave the wretched man who lay on his bed, eyes staring, shivering as though he had a fever? To the server's, servant's anxious question, Lord Lyttelton was unable to give coherent answer. Not he was not ill, yes, he was unwell. Search the room, close the windows, open the windows, get the doctor, do not get the doctor, send for a person, stay here, go away. Eventually, Lord Lyttelton showed signs of recovery. The relief valet suggested that he should fetch a ball of beef broth, which was about the most soothing, soothing thing he could think of. Pale and exhausted, Lord Lyttelton agreed. Ah, yes, I should like that, he said in a more normal voice. And the doctor, my lord, shall I send for him? <sighs> no, I should be all right presently. I must have had a bad dream, a nightmare. I doubt if the doctor has any pills against that. But there are some friends I must see during the day. Send messages to them. Mr. Andrews, Mr. Ayscoch, Mr. Pigot. I will give you a full list later. Fetch the broth and then I will leave my bread. When he was alone, Lord Lyttelton went over and over in his mind the evening of the night. Could it have been a dream? It seemed real at the time, but the dreams could seem real too. He got out of the bed and carefully examined the curtain. There was nothing to suggest that the mysterious woman had stood there and addressed him. Yet she was still so vivid in his mind. Her features, her voice, and above all, her words. He shuddered at the memory of them. He did not want to die. He enjoyed life, still fairly young, still fairly young. He had everything to live for. The only thing to do now was to talk it over with his friends, Miles Andrew and the others. Perhaps they would reassure him. During the day, a steady stream of callers came to the house in the Hill Street. To each of his friends, Lord Lyttelton told the story of the, his dreadful night. And as the day wore on, he found the reassurance he was seeking. Without exception, his friends found his story amusing. Was she pretty, Thomas? asked Myers Andrew. Not pretty exactly, Lord Lightrington replied, but beautiful. His friends laughed. Beautiful? Dreaming of beautiful women, eh, Thomas? <laughs> More likely you'll be married in three days, not dead. Of course it was a dream. I wish you weren't so superstitious. The weight of his friend's views finally convinced Lord Lyttelton that they were right. He began to feel less worried, less haunted, although when he was alone the face of the woman and her warning words returned to his memory. He decided that he must keep his mind off the whole affair, at least until after the three days were up. So he filled his house with company for breakfast, lunch and dinner. The plan succeeded, thanks to the good nature of Lord Lyttelton's friend. They had jolly party with witty talk. Lord Lyttelton entered into it all with eagerness and and everybody agreed that he was himself again. When Myers Andrews explained it to his host that he would not be present in the evening, having to go to Tartford for a few days, he remarked afterward to one of the other guests, he seemed to have forgotten about that wretched dream. I doubt if he can remember when it was that he was supposed to die. On the morning of the third day, Lord Lyttelton came slowly into the breakfast room at 10.30, advancing in a rather subdued way and greeting his friends who were already there very quietly. When asked after his health, he simply shrugged. He seemed content to listen to their talk without contributing anything himself. Jonathan Graves, a popular musician and church organist, who had been invited to entertain the others with his latest compositions, was particularly worried. His playing and singing seemed to have no effect on Lord Lyttelton's sudden melancholy. Miles Andrews had been wrong. He had not forgotten when he was due to die. 
By dinner time, however, Lord Lightenton seemed to have shaken off his gloom. After the meal, he rose from the table, smiled at them all, and said, Gentlemen, I am myself again. Thank you. The guests were dismayed when shortly afterwards their host slipped back into the former mood of depression, and when he was out of the room, Jonathan Graves remarked, Friends, we can do no more to cheer him up with talking and joking. It is obvious to me that we must practice a little deception. Deception, said Mr. Escor. How do you mean? Graves looked toward the door to ensure that there was no danger of his host overhearing. It is simple, he said in a low voice. Thomas is sad because he expects to die at midnight. Every watch and clock must seem to stare at him as if to say, We will fetch you at midnight, in four hours, three hours, two hours, and so on. By the time midnight comes, the poor fellow will probably die from sheer relief. But if when midnight comes, he is safely asleep in bed, then the danger will be over. But how can we cause him to retire before midnight? asked Mr. I Icecaw. Graves leaned toward the other. By altering every timepiece in this house, by putting them forward hour and hour, half an hour. To illustrate his point, he took his own watch from his pocket and carefully put it forward half an hour. After a discussion, it was generally agreed to be a good idea, and each man altered his own watch. Jonathan Graves rang for the valet. He explained the plan to him and asked if he could arrange to have the clocks altered. Yes, sir, answered William, and I will be responsible for altering his lordship's watch, which lies at the moment on his dressing table. Lord Lyttelton returned. The party continued and it was half-past eleven by the clock when he got up and announced that he wished to retire. He bade them all good night, received their thanks for the pleasant evening, and left the room with perfect calmness. His departure brought a certain relief to his friends. They were able to talk openly about the subject that was in everybody's mind. None of them was prepared to accept that it was a ghost who had brought the warning to Lord Lyttelton, but no one had better explanation than the dream theory. I think we can put our watches now, Jonathan Graves remarked later. Good heaven, it's time I went home, he added, realizing that the actual time was nearly midnight. I too, said Mr. Ascock, and I shall leave happy in the knowledge that our, our friend is soundly asleep. Let us hope so, said another guest. As they made their way to the cloakroom to collect their coats, Suddenly, out of the blue, came the sound of a bell. The men fell silent, looking at each other in consternation. Another bell rang out. That is one clock we cannot alter, Graves whispered hoarsely. I had forgotten the parish church. Three, four, the bell clanged. Five, six, seven, and from above there came a shot. Come quickly, my lord is dying. Eight, nine, rang the bell. The men dashed up the stairs to where William, pale as death, stood outside the door of Lord Lighterton's bedroom. Ten, eleven, inside the room, Graves, Icecock, and some of the saw Lord Lighterton twisting in agony. Twelve, the last bell of midnight sounded, and they saw their friend collapse in death. Later, with all the guests gathered together in the library, the valet told them what had happened. When my master came into room, he said, he made his usual preparations for bed. While I was putting away his clothes, I noticed that he was taking frequent glances at his watch. I had the impression that he wished me to stay as long as possible because he did everything very slowly. When he, was, when he got into the bed, he ordered the curtains at the foot to be closed. Then he looked at his watch again and saw that it was a few minutes to twelve. He asked me to look at my watch and was much relieved when it agreed with his. He then put both watches to his ear, making sure that they were both going. He stared at them until the hands had passed midnight. Then he handed mine back to me and told me to prepare his medicine. When I returned with the glass, it was turned a quarter after twelve. His lost shape gave a wry smile. The mysterious lady is not a true prophetess, I find. Come, I will wait no longer. Let me drink my medicine and then I will try to sleep. He drank it and bade me good night. But as he settled down 
to sleep the parish church clock began to strike. At that moment, his lordship gave a sort of choking gasp and tried to say something to me. I could not tell what he was saying, and I rushed to the door to call you gentlemen and his friends. So, the mysterious lady was a prophetess, said Jonathan Graves somberly. And she kept her appointment. Well then, I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any more suggestions for any more stories, then do tell me. I hope you're relieved. Goodbye for now.